welcome everybody and thank you so much for for being here and just i know that sort of most of you probably speak french and english but just before i switch to french can you check the little globe so at the bottom of your zoom and select the channel that you want to be in so if you want to listen in French, select French. If you want to listen in English, select in English. And if you're comfortable with both, go with the original audio. Et c'est à ce moment-là que je vais changer en français. And this is where I'm going to switch to English in order to welcome Agnès Martin-Lugan. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you here today with us in order to provide us with this second keynote on the novels, popular novels and feminism in these uh, novels. And we thank you for being here with us and having decided to share this afternoon with us. Thank you, Agnès Martin-Lugan. Thank you. Hello. No, it's actually my honor to be part of the of this uh, webinar and to have the possibility to talk to all of you about my novels and my way of writing and my characters and my whole journey. So I'm really happy to spend the afternoon with you all. Thank you so much. And I know that it's been two and a half years that we have tried to do this. So it's really lovely to be able to do it finally and to really have this, this audience that comes from everywhere in the world, from France, from the UK, from Australia, from everywhere really. So so just to give you all the structure of what we're going to be doing today, we will start with an introduction. I will also share a Padlet with you. It's the first time that I did it. So it's um, a bit um, basic, we could say, but it's just for you to know of all the novels by Agnès. And then we will have a general debate and we will also have readings both in French and English. And when we start with a reading, please don't worry if you cannot hear the interpretation on your um, headsets that's because we will be reading in French and then we will read in English it actually will be my students who will read it in English and I would like to thank them for being here with us today so I'm going to start I am really moved so please Thank you, and I'll start. So, um, Agnès Martin-Lugan was born by the sea in Saint-Malo, northwest of France, and she started her career as a um, clinical psychologist specializing in early childhood and mother-child relationships. During her parental leave, she published her first novel, Happy People Read and Drink Coffee, in self-published format on the Amazon platform. Uh, within a few days, the novel climbed the platform's charts, selling thousands of copies, and she she quickly reached the top spot. In a few months, she was then spotted by the publishing house Michel Lafon, and she published with them a novel per year. Ten years after, so now, ten years after she started on Amazon, Agnès Martin-Lugan has written ten novels that have been sold uh, the world over, over four million copies sold, and translated into 34 languages. Her novels feature strong independent women at different stages of their lives, and they must find tools and solutions to find happiness, balance, inner peace, love or friendship, getting rid of regrets. Accompanying these heroines on their, get, on their quests, readers laugh, cry, share love and empathy, pro proving that it is actually quite true that happy people read and drink coffee. And I am going to write on the chat for you. Um, I, I just told you it's the first time that I've done a Padlet, but I think it's easier to access a Padlet. And that way you will have access even after this seminar, you will have access to it. And I wanted to, to thank Honoré uh, from the Lafont uh, team for having provided us with all the information that's on the Padlet. So I'm going to share it with you. Obviously, you can see it, you can see it here on the screen. It's very small here on the screen, but you can obviously zoom in when you choose the Padlet. Here to your left you have the biography and her website, a link to her website with lots of different materials. And if you click on each of these boxes, you will see that there is a detailed description both in English and in French in comments as well. And you can obviously zoom in and have a bigger version of this. So this is just for you to take a look at it and so that you can read some information on the different novels that Agnes has written 
during these last 10 years. And I think that we're going to start with this conversation if we're all ready. So I would like to talk with you about the choice of the narrative voice, because you always uh, write in the first person and it's usually about women. So how do you how do you choose this narrative voice? Well, it actually came in a very natural way to me when I when I started writing for the first time. To be honest, when when I started um, writing Happy People Read and Drink Coffee, which is my first novel, I didn't have anything else written previously. I had never tried writing novels previously. But instinctively, I'd say, this this was imposed on me, actually. I started writing in the first person, and I, I it's actually a choice that I have never rethought or uh, questioned ever since I started, and it's been a few years since I started. So... The more I progress and advance in time, and I, I'm starting to try new paths, obviously, in my last year novel, which is the, the Dacha, I have a chapter that is in the third person. I have actually, for some time, uh, when I when I wrote uh, The Folly, I also changed. But in general, these are, are very, very uh, specific things. When I write on the third person, it's because I really feel that I am in a situation where I need to to um, get outside of the skin of my main character as though I need it to be um, above what happened. And that is what actually happened in that chapter in The Folly. But outside of those exceptions, I, I think that nowadays I'm still not capable of, of writing a whole novel from, and from beginning till the end if it's not on the first person. Because, because I think that in my process and how I I identify with the main character I think that it is it is um, it is something indispensable it's my way of writing I have to really try and slip in that character's skin and I have to be um, merging with with that character it is part of my way of writing if I am not completely united with this uh, this person this character I can't I can't I cannot do it it doesn't sound it doesn't sound true it doesn't ring true and uh, there's always a moment when when I just click and I completely and I completely forget myself and I only think about my first character and I think that obviously I have lots of, uh, of memories of moments when I was writing when I didn't know who I was even when I break you know when I when I leave my office and and um, and I deal with my day-to-day -day and I'm with my children there's always a time that I need where I actually have to take a few steps back and, and try and remember, who am I? Are you you? Are you her? Who are you? So I always have these moments going from one to the other, from the world of writing to the real world, my real life. So after that, well, this this uh, feminine uh, game, and this is the second part of your question, I'd say that it has actually come in a very natural way to me as well. Writing the happy people read and drink coffee immediately. That was the way in which it started when I had the first idea of the novel, when that idea started um, has started being born in my head. If I have to tell you in detail, actually, I was I was at home. My husband and my son, who was 18 months old, were were playing. They were playing um, in the living room, and I had a feeling that the time that time was stopping, and and it kind of. I was stuck, and I thought, what what would happen if I lose this? Uh, and I thought. No, 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 I would have to leave. I would have to go very far away. So this is the story. I have to write this story because otherwise I wouldn't know where I am. And it actually was the story of a woman. And it was immediately, that was the process. I identified with that with that woman. This, this game actually started without me knowing if I was capable of writing or not. And then all the novels that followed that one, they all had some uh, protagonists, uh, main characters who were women. I did um, get out of my way, uh, for instance, with regards to the, the, the book, um, I can't get the music out of my mind. I started thinking about that as well. And the, the man, Yanis, started 
making noise, lots of noise. And I and, it's, and he was telling me that he had lots of things to say. And I couldn't I couldn't just leave him aside. I had to give him the floor. So I did this exercise of a um, double perspective and I had and I, I repeated it with a folly with my last novel in a more intense way because that's where we're really going from one point of view to another, man, woman, uh, during the whole novel. And I, it's an experience that I... But it's actually the same. It came to me naturally, instinctively. I think that I need that instinctive side of things in writing. When a character imposes itself on me, whether it's a man or a woman, if he's making loads of noise or she's making loads of noise, I need to let them speak. And after 10 years, I have already experienced different ways of do, different narratives, um, narrative forms. And I feel like I'm just at the beginning of this exploration, really. That's that's great. And actually, you, I anticipated lots of things, didn't I? Yes, you anticipated my second question about this change in voices that we see in the folly, but also that we see in um, I can't get that music out of my mind because but since we since we're talking about changing the voice or the perspective we also see a change with regards to titles as well we have gone from longer titles in the first uh, novels to shorter titles and more recent with just a name with an article or so on and how did this change come about in your titles well it it wasn't something that I, ha I had decided it's true that with all my first novels it just came about um, in a natural way, I just looked for sentences that could tell a whole story in and of themselves. And I wanted to be able to hook the, the audience. I wanted to have sentences that did correspond to what was going on in the novel. And with, for instance, happy people read and drink coffee, and uh, for instance, happiness slips through my fingers, it's, it's well, actually, it's that the, it follows happy people read, drink, read and drink coffee and I had to follow up on that so it wasn't just anything so I had this title I thought that I, I would never find a title I I thought I was going to publish a novel without a title we would just say this is the, the second part because I had to be at, that, at the level of that first title and I was complete and, and I did listen to some music during the time I was writing the novel, and then I realized that this, and um, you know that it says, sorry, some, um, it says, don't worry, life's easy, but I did have that provocative side of things in that title, and it, it did correspond to Diane's state of mind at the end of the novel, because, because she, she, was, she was really better, feeling better, and she actually reached the light, we could say. And I continued, and then, and then we reached my seventh novel, um, the decision that actually changed lots of things for me in writing, because it was the first time that I started writing a novel without knowing the end. So up till then, I, I mean, my first three novels, I had an extremely detailed plan. I knew everything that was going to happen, each scene, everything. The, nothing was random. I had locked all of my characters in. I, it wasn't easy, I understand, but I, I could do it. And then the three in the middle, the three novels in the middle, where I knew the beginning, uh, the middle and the end, but I didn't know the road that would be followed by the characters. And, and and I just allowed for my characters to surprise me. And then I got to the seventh novel, where I had the beginning. I had the uh, I had my different uh, characters. I had a woman, but I didn't know how it's going. It was going to end. And I looked for it and I looked for it, but I couldn't find the end. And there was a time when I kind of felt that I needed to start writing. You know, uh, writing, and my characters are, were actually calling me. So it was extremely. Um, it was extremely fast. I needed to start writing, and I really need to to 
to wait a long time for that end to show itself. I actually found it at the same time as the print, uh, the main character. And uh, when I when I discovered it, it was the, the decision. I had it under my eyes. I had it from the beginning. I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to see it, just like my main character. And this, this word, the decision, it came back to me. And I thought, yes, this is it. It cannot be anything else. So so when I when I got to my publisher with this title, when, when we got from happy people read and drink coffee and then six years later the decision she thought what is she doing well and it did make sense it did make sense so my titles always have to make sense and since then it was always short uh, titles but I'm not forbidding myself from having long sentences. If for the next novel I have a sentence that, or a, um, a, a bigger group of, of words maybe that could appear and that could make sense with regards to the novel, then if that title makes sense and it couldn't be anything else, then I will change again. Yes, and I think that we have already talked for 15, 20 minutes. Would it be all right for you if we started with the reading of the first chapter of The Folly so that we can um, introduce um, everyone to the translation that has been published in English? So we're going to end the translation for a little while, for the interpretation. So once Agnès Martin Lugan and our student Nadia read the chapters, then you have to choose again your channel on the globe that is is at the bottom of your screen. And I would like to thank uh, Rosie, who is the uh, translator, who has translated um, these chapters for our conference. So I think that she is going to join us um, later on. But what I would like to do is to uh, share her link, the link uh, of her website, so that you can take a look at her work, because she's working on other texts as well, and other uh, books by Agnes, mainly because uh, many people here work on translation. So I think we can stop. So I will give the floor to Agnès Martin Lugan for the first chapter of Folly, The Folly. Quelque part, le vent soufflait, la marée était haute, la houle comblait mes espérances. Les vagues frappaient la falaise dans un fracas continu. Elle martelait si fort la roche qu'elle repartait au large et entrait en collision avec les suivantes, créant des gerbes d'écume bouillonnantes, fascinant, apaisant. Ce déchaînement des éléments m'attirait inexorablement. Je pouvais sauter, disparaître à jamais. Enfin, on ne me retrouverait pas ou alors dans plusieurs semaines. Sur quelle plage mon corps serait-il charrié Peu importe. Était-ce le moment celui que j'attendais depuis, depuis si longtemps, rien ne me retenait. Un rire amer s'échappa de ma bouche tandis que la pluie s'abattait sur moi. J'y étais. Un pas. Un deuxième. Un troisième. J'étais au bord, prêt à basculer. Le précipice m'appelait. Les yeux fermés, je convoquais des notes. Les accords qui m'accompagneraient. Mon esprit les jouait dans une dernière partition. Le visage de Nathan m'apparut. Je reculais en chancelant, la respiration courte, si courte que je dus reposer mes bras sur mes genoux, le corps brisé en deux, à croire que j'avais couru. Mon regard foudroya la tempête venue trop tôt. Je hurlais sur elle, elle me narguait, tenir encore pour lui. Nathan était le seul être sur cette terre que je devais protéger. En titubant, je regagnais la maison, cette maison comme une tanière, comme un piège. Armé de ma bouteille et de mes cachetons, je suis que la nuit ne serait pas si décevante. Merci beaucoup. Et maintenant, Nadia, if you want to start with the English translation of chapter one. Somewhere. Wait, sorry, can you hear me? Perfect. Yes. Somewhere. The wind was up. The tide was high. The swell was just as I'd hoped. Waves were thrashing against the cliff, each one pounding the rock so hard that it was hurled back out to sea and into the path of the next, creating furious eruptions of spume. The frenzy of the elements was enthralling, soothing, irresistible. I could jump, disappear forever, at last, 
They wouldn't find me, or not for weeks. Which beach would my body wash up on? It didn't much matter. Was this the moment, the one I'd been waiting for all this time? There was nothing stopping me. A bitter laugh burst from my lips as the rain battered down on me. I'd made it. One step, two, three. I was at the edge, ready to drop. The void was calling to me, closing my eyes. I summoned up notes, the chords that would accompany me. My mind tinkled them out in a final score. Then I saw Nathan's face. I reeled back, gasping, so breathless that I had to rest my, rest my hands on my knees, my body cleft in two. Anyone would have thought I'd been running. I glowered at the storm that had come too soon. I roared at its mockery. Keep going, for his sake. Nathan was the only being on this earth I had to protect. I staggered back to the house. That house like a lair, like a trap. Armed with my bottle and my pills, I sensed the night wouldn't be quite such a disappointment. Thank you so much, Nadia. That was brilliant. And if everybody can please join me in thanking Nadia, because she'll have to leave a bit earlier today. Uh, so thank you so much. Both Nadia and Gia are part of the French Reading Club, and they're, they're just finishing off their first year. So I'm very, very grateful to them for joining us today. Thank you so much. And l'interprétation est de nouveau commencée. Donc n'oubliez pas de sélectionner votre langue. Donc, dans le globe en bas, sélectionnez le français ou l'anglais ou si vous voulez rester sur euh, l'original. Euh, Agnès Martin-Lugan, est-ce que ça vous dérangerait de parler un peu du, du premier chapitre, de, ce, de, cette, de cette incipite à la déraison qui est vraiment… Euh, bah, c'est la déraison. Oui. Et on voit l'image de la mère qui est extrêmement importante dans ce roman, mais aussi dans d'autres. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous parler un peu des opportunités créatives que vous offre la mer dans tous ces états Alors, la mer… Euh, alors... Something that is extremely visceral. And it's true that during the first chapter, um, at the folly, we are really in something that is quite violent. This violent relationship with the sea that is going to shake you, that is going to call you, but that is also going to to hurt, to 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 damage, and it's just an expression of of that folly uh, for the two main uh, characters of the um, of the folly, such as, uh, for instance, Joshua, and he is completely eaten up by his demons, his rage, and alcohol and drugs and who who is going to the to the to the cliff just to to throw himself in the sea because he knows that the sea is not offering you any gifts so if you jump you will end your life um, for good so when When I think of my relationship with the sea with regards to writing, I wouldn't say that the sea is inspiring me different stories. It's going to be something that I can use as a decor, as a, as a scene, as a means of expression to make the bond between the, the feelings of the, of the character and the state he or she is in. And then when I block... When I'm blocked, when I need to get outside of, of my office after days and nights writing, I need to go see the, the sea. I have to walk down the beach and, and to, to get rid of writing. And, but I'm, I'm not completely separated from writing, obviously, because when I, when I go take a look at the sea and I'm, and I'm by the sea while writing, even if it 
place just to to breathe a little and to be outside of, of what I'm doing. I will still listen to the music that I listen to in order to write and I will still go round and round and round it. But at the same time, I have the noise of, of the waves breaking and the wind, this sea wind that is going to bring a great um great amount of fresh air that i need while i'm writing yes those emotions that we feel at the beginning of the folly it's the folly and we only realize at the end that actually this character and the voice is actually a man because it's only with uh, armed with my bottle yes exactly it's and it's something that in English you cannot see it because we don't have that in, in English. But what were the intentions, what were the reactions that you would have liked, that you would have liked to, to share with the, with the writer, with this, this, uh, this fluid situation where we don't know who's speaking? What were the reactions that you were expecting for your readers? Well, actually, I, I was looking for immediately just throw them in the head of a character and to uh, question them because I know my readers, uh, they, they know me, and they all thought from the beginning that it was a woman and some didn't even see that that accord between the the verb and the and, and the pronoun so they didn't see it and others said oh no no that's a mistake that's a typo it cannot be one e it has to have two e's but no it was actually done uh, on purpose and those who were um more alert they said oh she's doing something that she doesn't usually do but i wanted to to entertain that flow and i wanted to i wanted to not lose my chapter from one chapter to the next because the first one starts with that somewhere and then you go to the next chapter and you're somewhere else so to me I didn't want to give more uh, more tips. I didn't want them to know because I could have said Joshua and then Madeline and the problem would have been solved. But I didn't want that. So during the whole writing of the folly, I wanted to ask my audience to work. I wanted the reader to work. I wanted them to also understand that they had a role in the reading, that I wanted them to ask themselves questions and to try and understand. And I also wanted them to try and imagine that what I'm saying is not just me. So, to me, these were some tips that I was giving them. They were not very obvious, but you had this part and this other part. With, they couldn't, they might not have seen the fact that it was a that was a he and not a she. But I wanted to to show those two characters, and I wanted them to say, "But when are we going to find the link between these two characters?" I was telling two stories that were parallel stories that were a reflection of each other, because what I did want to do when I was writing the folly was. C'est-à-dire que voilà, vous êtes dans le premier chapitre. You are on the first chapter. You have this night um, by a cliff with Joshua, but then the second chapter, you get to know Madeleine, and it's that same night. It's actually the same moment in time, but in two different places. And I wanted to constantly play with that mirror game into between the one and the other. So when Joshua wakes up later on during uh, breakfast, the chapter after that one will be Madeleine's breakfast, so that we can really show the difference between this, the the uh, the situation they're each in so that we can really entertain that fire you could say so so they have nothing obviously there is nothing that would let us know that there is a relationship between them but my readers know that not something must be there so i like to just throw some some ideas here and there but not say everything and and actually when i was writing this novel I wanted to go to an essential way of writing. With. So I didn't want to be very baroque. I didn't want to give too many details. I wanted to really be focused on the two main topics of the of the novel, which are death and um, being crazy in love, and to 
to only talk about that which was to feed these two topics and the progression of those two char those two characters as well, those two people. So it could have been four times as longer, but then it wouldn't have been the same story. If I had told the whole uh, their whole life from the beginning till the end, it wouldn't have been folly. It would have been a saga, and it was not at all what I what I was looking for. It wasn't it wasn't the, the kind of writing that I wanted to that I wanted to do for these two people, these two uh, characters. We've already talked about music and musicality and I think we're going to go back to that and I think it's very important for your work. But in this first chapter we see some some long sentences, other short sentences. There are sentences that are just one word. So there is a sort of a tonality or rhythm that you impose here. And 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 especially in a novel where a music is much more important because it is important for the two um, characters, you know, music, rhythm. Well, yes, these sentences where there is a bit of everything. Well, to me, this style, this way of writing correspond to what I felt with regards to the way in which the character felt. Joshua can can be can be very 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 violent and his words can be very 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 short, he can be very short, and sometimes a word is much more impacting than a long sentence that is uh, five lines long. But sometimes Joshua has this capacity of, and I'm thinking about certain parts in the in the book later on, where he has this capacity of letting go and, and letting his mind go when he's in a phase that is more uh, calm. I'm not going to say calm because it's never calm, but at least he lets his spirit think and he does take a step back and thinks about his own life and he talks about his own life to himself. And in that case, he can... Uh, be, he can he can think about himself, his different states of minds, what he has been through. So to me, it was there was a logic to it. There was a logic to it, considering his folly. So we could go from one way of writing to another in an absolutely uncalculated way. I mean, when I was writing Joshua's chapters, as a matter of fact, I actually I was not the same person I was when I was writing Madeleine's chapters, even physically. I mean, my position, it was different. I mean, I I was quite tense. My, my, my whole body was really tense. And I, he... Um, Joshua actually lived in me in a very powerful way. And this this way of actually this this uh, this this way of of speaking with just a few words and then long sentences it was it was this rhythm was a, a way of well it was very instinctive but it was really because it was what corresponded to the to that that character and with the with my ten novels, I think that I can now ha I have enough um, of an experience, and I can say that my style depends on the personality and the, the way my characters feel. If I think about my first novel, Diane would never have would never have thought as Joshua did. And that is why it's not written in the same way. Even if my last year novel, if I consider the f the, the one that is closest to uh, the folly, Adacha uh, Ermin, does not have the same way of thinking, the same way of, of reflecting as Joshua does. So the novel obviously cannot have the same style either. Absolutely. And I would like to go back to a word that you have all, all, all already used, which is the, the urgency and the management of time in this first chapter, but also in every, every other book we feel that uh, the characters have some sort of urgent thing that they need to do. But what are the challenges to, to, to talk about the urgency that they feel, especially in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that will always stand because it's the written word, we can always reopen the book. And how can we maintain that urgency in the novel? Well, 
Moi, je, je, je travaille vraiment. Euh, I really work. Si vous voulez, avant d'écrire. I mean, before I write, j ai, j ai, I. J'ai vraiment besoin de toute une page. I really de need to euh, reflect. I need to get to know my euh, characters débuter, before I start and after I I let myself be and not be in control and let them think of them on. Alors, by themselves and feel by themselves. So you're absolutely right when you talk about urgency, this urgency of, of, of living, um, that's something that many of my characters uh, feel. Or having to solve problems um, is not always this urgency of living, which is much more extreme, but the urgency of solving problems, of, of making progress, of, of moving things around. I, I, I am fascinated, actually, by all the human and um, psychological mechanisms, conscious or otherwise, of trying to repair oneself or to um, advance, make progress, or even hurt oneself. Because sometimes you need to hurt yourself to make progress in life. And I like to, re to write all of these things. And it's true that I've always, when I am in the phase, the phase of writing, I always have this first spurt, we could say, uh, that, that comes out. And, and, and then it's... And then I will re I will retake I will retake it a number of times. It does. It depends. It's I don't know the number of times I will have to retake it. I don't know how this first bird will come out. But the more I reread, the more I I am in harmony with the state of mind of the of the character. So so maybe it's at this point where uh, sentences can get shorter or. Quite opposite, uh, quite in the opposite, we can work them more, that we can fine tune them more, even changing what is requires time. And you need an unnumerable, un, I, I, mean, I, I don't know how many times to re read them, re to rework them. And in the folly, I was always looking for that specific word, the right word. And sometimes when I found the word, then the whole sentence needed to change because. I had actually put my finger on the word that I had been looking for for days just to say, to say what my character felt, to say what their sentiment, their emotion was. And this is what I'm going to look for in all my novels. I have to try and do that. It's urgency, but it can also be love. It can be a rage. It can be, uh, you know, the whole... Um, a whole array of sentiments or feelings that um, humans can have, but I have to look for the word that will just tell us what the feeling was. Yes, I wanted to get the Dutch app because we wanted to to now talk about uh, the Dutch app and ask questions about the Dutch app, but, but um, in opposition with this urgency, we also have, uh, um, we have talked a lot about time going by, so the, the, the characters we always have, for instance, in the walls, it, it can in the last 10 years or even more. Um, but how do we... You have talked to us about how to write urgency, but how do we talk about this time going by so that it is still credible and recognizable? Because many of um, of our of your readers recognize themselves in those in those uh, characters, and they recognize the time, whether it is uh, the, the 80s or the 90s or 2010. Yes, sometimes I have leaped forward on time. If we talk about the Dacha, which is one of my longest uh, novels, it's 20 years that go by from the first chapter and the second. So it's actually, uh, it's a big difference. It's a big difference in time. But a lot of that was also a, a work of, of reflection during the writing where I have been asking myself questions for a very long time regarding whether I should uh, um, explain what those 20 years were. Do I have to explain everything that happened during those 20 years or not? And in the end, we ha I had to think about the essential. Because in my head, I needed to be able to, to find and to understand what were the, the key moments, the important moments during those 20 years that could that could help Hermine 20 years later. I don't know if I'm making myself understood. I don't know if Matilde is, 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 is getting what I'm trying to say, but I, I wrote this first chapter, so it was 20 years ago, and then I went to 20 years later, and while I was writing, I, I knew that I had everything in my head, obviously, the whole history, the whole story, but I hadn't written it yet. And I told myself, 
Okay, so let's see. Why why have we gotten here? And what was the element, what was the event that could make Armin go forward in her questioning and her evolution in what is happening right now? And every time when I work on a big flashback such as this one, I always ask myself, what's the interest of this? And I don't want to write something or tell something just, just because. Because um, because I'll have more pages and it will be beautiful. No, no, no. I'm going back to what I said previously. I know I'm, I'm repeating myself, but I have to go back to that meaning of sense, the sense. And sometimes some um, characters are hiding things from me. So Hermine, for instance, uh, there is a moment when I really... I mean, we're talking about the present, and there is a moment when we're doing a flashback and we find Hermine uh, when she was a kid, when she was a little girl. And I, I, I felt that she hadn't told me everything. There was something she hadn't told me. And and, and I talked to my uh, characters, actually. So so I told Hermine, no, now you have to explain to me what happened, because there are things I don't understand. And I, I, I feel that the moment has come for me to tell me. And we have to be on the same page so that we can make Make progress and actually I I had this flashback chapter where I I finally met Armin when she was a little girl and this this part of her life this little while in her life is just a few days that she's telling you about during those uh, pages is enough to understand who Armin is now and and it's actually always that question that I ask myself when there are flashbacks, and that is why the folly, well, yes, I mean, it could have been three times longer, but in the, but what for? What for? What we needed was the essential of his story, her story, to understand why they were where they were now. Yes, I recognize those those pages about Hermine because I really felt them. It was as though the, the, the doors opened up and my 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 tears, my emotions just came out. So that yes, yeah, the emotion completely controlled me. So this is the novel, the Dacha, which was published in 2021. And actually here we we see the Dacha. And it is a place that becomes a, a, a character in and of itself. And since it was published in 2021, and uh, we hope to be out of the pandemic now, are there any links between this story, which is almost um, a closed door story, but there are moments when we're out of the data, but not all of them, and all of us, we were, con we were locked down. We were uh, behind closed doors somehow. Is there a link? Well, yes, that's paradoxical in this novel, isn't it? Because the Dacha, when we consider the story of this novel, it, we have to understand that for a fair, for some time, I had been wanting to write a novel uh, that happened in um, in a hotel, and Dacha is the name of the hotel where the whole story takes place, and the characters that were imposing themselves on me during the previous years were not made to go to a hotel. But I was keeping that in a corner of my mind and then during spring 2020 i'm going to frame the context so that you understand our lockdown in france and so in france we got out of the first lockdown which was the hardest one where we were not uh, we, where we didn't really get out of the house at all and i started thinking about my next novel because i could not write during during lockdown i did not really benefit from that first lockdown i couldn't do anything i was incapable of doing anything and and the hotel came back to me very quickly and I thought I really have to write about about this novel this novel in the hotel but who who could live in this hotel and the three characters actually impose themselves on me Hermine, Jo and Masha who are the owners of the of the hotel during the summer where uh, the Covid was a bit calmer um, I was I was cooking um, that that novel in my head and Covid exploded again again in France at the end of, of August and I decided to uh, get back to my office and start writing the novel and thanks to the Dutch I didn't see the next six months of Covid COVID. So I found myself a refuge, and that refuge was the Dacha. 
And, and you are abs you're absolutely right. It's actually behind closed doors because we, we don't leave the hotel. But it is, a, it is actually a place where people touch themselves, they kiss themselves, they share uh, lunches and dinners together, they dance, they cry in, in, their, in someone else's embrace. So it's actually the whole life that we had previously, the whole life that we had before. And we didn't know when we were going to get that life back at that time. So I decided to slip naturally into the dacha and I was really, really well inside that dacha. And when I say that it was my refuge, it was my haven. It was it was my haven, not just Hermine's haven, it was mine as well. I didn't see what was going on around me because I was there, I was actually there. And when the novel was done, when it was finished, I thought, oh, I want to go back. I want to go back because I, I didn't I didn't want to go back to reality because uh, the reality had not improved. I mean, that was uh, January 2021, so it wasn't great at the time. And But actually, I was in my little bubble in a different place, completely locked, locked up, but it protected me from that health crisis that the whole world lived in. Yes, yes, that's a lockdown that is filled with hope, love, friendship. So this idea of refuge is something that we have talked about in the previous panel. Before this intervention, we have actually talked about that idea of, of escaping, of refuge. So we might have questions with regards to that topic. And I am aware of the time because we could talk for hours and hours and end. But would it be all right if we could go to chapter 19 of the folly? And this is where we are going to do the same thing that we did previously, because I believe there are new members amongst the audience. So in a few seconds, the interpretation is going to finish. And then we will read the chapter in French. Actually, Agnès Martin-Lugan will read it in French. And then uh, Gia will read it in English. And the uh, tra uh, uh, translation was done by Rosie. And you will be able to listen to that. Reading. Donc, quand vous êtes prête, on peut y aller. Au centre de la plage, la nuit qui tombait les protégeait, les enveloppait, les dissimulait. Elle atteignit enfin le sable. Elle lutta contre un vertige qu'elle défia pour le tenir loin d'elle. Il n'avait plus besoin de se dépêcher, de courir vers elle. Elle n'était plus un mirage, il était en paix. Elle l'avait toujours apaisé. Il sut qu'il ne sauterait pas. Elle le chercha du regard gêné par la pluie. Elle le vit. Son cœur battit plus fort, à tel point qu'elle crut que son corps se dissolvait sous le coup de l'émotion. Elle ne s'attendait pas à ce que cela soit si violent. Comment était-ce possible qu'il ait encore ce pouvoir sur elle Il marcha encore quelques mètres vers elle, puis s'arrêta. Elle devait lui revenir, le rejoindre. C'était à elle de le retrouver. Leur dernier rendez-vous manqué ne devait plus l'être. Alors il lutta contre la pulsion de franchir la distance en premier. Il se prépara à se contenir, à garder la tête froide et savoura sa victoire, l'admirant tandis qu'elle marchait avec fébrilité vers lui. Il la sentait bouleversée, il avait gagné. Elle ralentit, se convainquant que tout était encore possible. Soit elle n'allait pas mourir, soit elle pouvait faire demi-tour, oublier qu'il était là et rentrer chez elle. Elle eut envie de rire de la méchanceté de la fatalité, de sa faiblesse, de sa stupidité. Comment avait-elle pu songer qu'elle aurait la force de lutter contre cette attraction Elle savoura chaque seconde du chemin jusqu'à lui. Il n'y aurait pas deux retrouvailles. Il n'y en aurait qu'une, et ils étaient en train de la vivre. Ses jambes la portèrent à peine sur les derniers mètres. Elle était devant lui. Enfin, il lutta contre leur rituel. Il ne s'autorisait pas encore à prendre sa main, passer son pouce sur sa peau comme il le faisait toujours quand il se retrouvait après une séparation trop longue. Il ne voulait pas l'effrayer. Il la dominait, comme avant. Elle n'avait pas grandi. Cette remarque le fit sourire. Elle avait vieilli et paraissait épuisée, éreintée, mais elle n'en était que plus belle. Sa bouche rouge s'éride autour de ses yeux de cette couleur si particulière, un iris vert entouré d'un fil d'or. Son cou fin est dégagé malgré le froid. Il aimait poser sa main dessus, l'entourer, le protéger. Il était toujours aussi grand face à elle. Elle se sentait toujours aussi fragile devant lui. 
Rien n'avait changé. Son regard dur et tourmenté lui donnait cette impression qu'il pouvait lire en elle. Il avait vieilli et n'en était que plus charismatique. Il semblait encore plus fatigué qu'avant, plus sombre aussi, et d'autant plus attirant. À l'époque déjà, elle s'amusait à tenter de percer son mystère. Il la faisait vibrer avant, et c'était encore le cas aujourd'hui, après seulement quelques instants. Il l'aimantait, la rassurait, il la faisait vivre. Elle était vivante, vivante et déstabilisée par sa présence. Elle était heureuse alors qu'elle n'aurait pas dû. « Madi, tu es revenu. »« Madi, ce nom qui n'appartenait qu'à lui, qu'à eux. Personne d'autre que lui ne l'avait jamais prononcé. Ses yeux se remplirent de larmes rien qu'en entendant sa voix grave. Ils s'observaient comme des adversaires fascinés l'un par l'autre. Il paniqua. C'était trop beau, trop beau pour être vrai. Il devait en être certain. Sa main se leva, s'approcha avec une lenteur infinie de ce visage dont il rêvait de jour comme de nuit. Il fixa ses doigts qui s'avançaient vers elle. Elle se retint d'aller au devant de ce contact dont elle rêvait depuis tant d'années, dont elle était en manque depuis la dernière fois qu'il l'avait effleurée. Enfin, il la toucha. Il redécouvrit le grain de sa peau qu'il n'avait jamais oublié. Elle tressaillit. Sa main froide, forte et délicate. Ses paupières se fermèrent de plaisir. « Tu es réel. Elle abandonna sa joue contre sa paume. Elle sentit ses doigts la caresser et essuyer la larme qui roulait. Il était réel, ce geste était réel, beaucoup trop réel. Elle prit une profonde inspiration, elle respira son parfum, son parfum et s'éloigna en ouvrant les yeux. Il pencha la tête sur le côté, dans un mouvement de surprise. Il endossa ce sourire narquois qu'elle aimait tant avant. Elle lui en renvoya un, timide. Elle le regretta aussitôt, percutée par le souvenir de leur rencontre. Elle lui avait envoyé le même lorsque leurs regards s'étaient croisés pour la première fois, et qu'elle était déjà amoureuse. « Je dois rentrer, Joshua. Ma fille va s'inquiéter. » Sa voix douce et éraillée n'avait pas changé. La plus belle harmonie qu'il ait jamais entendue. Il lui sourit encore. Elle aussi. Puis elle se retourna et prit la direction de son escalier en se retenant de tituber. Elle était ivre. Ivre d'interrogation, de bouleversement, de culpabilité, de terreur, de regret. Lui était ivre de bonheur. Merci beaucoup. Et maintenant, Gia, pour la traduction en anglais. Gia, over to you whenever you're ready. I hope you can hear me. Perfect. Okay. In the middle of the beach, night was falling, shielding them, enveloping them, concealing them. She reached the sand at last. She beat back a wave of dizziness, fending it far away from her. He no longer felt the need to rush to go charging towards her. She wasn't a mirage now. He was at one. She'd always had that soothing effect on him. In that moment, he knew he wouldn't jump. She scanned around for him, her view hampered by the rain. Then she saw him. Her heart gave a fiercer thump, so hard she thought her body was about to give way from the force of the emotion. She wasn't expecting it to be this violent. How could he still have such a hold over her? He walked a few more meters towards her, then stopped. She had to come back to him, rejoin him. It was down to her to find him again. The last missed encounter must cease to be the last. He fought back the urge to close the gap first. Still to contain himself, to remain impassive. He savored his victory, drinking, drinking her in as she walked shakily towards him. He could sense her disarray. He had won. She slowed down, trying to convince herself anything was still possible, that she wasn't going to die, that she could turn around, forget he was here, and go home. She suddenly wanted to laugh at the cruelty and inevitability of it all, at her weakness, at her stupidity. How could she have dreamt she'd be strong enough to fight the attraction? She savored every moment of the walk towards him. There wouldn't be a second chance to reunite. There would only be one and they were living it right now. Her legs barely carried her over the final meters. She was there before him at last. He fought against their old ritual. He couldn't yet allow himself to take her hand and trace his thumb across her skin, as he always used to do whenever they met again after too long apart. He didn't want to scare her. 
He had her in his thrall, just like back then. She hadn't grown up. The observation made him smile. She, she had aged, and she looked weary, exhausted, but she was only more beautiful for it. Her red lips, the creases around her eyes, with their so distinctive colouring. Green irises ribboned with gold. Her slender neck left bare in spite of the cold. He used to love placing his hand over it, making sure it was encircled, protected. He stood as imposing as ever in front of her. She felt as fragile as ever before him. Nothing had changed. His steely, tormented expression, giving her the familiar sense that he could read what was inside her. He had aged in a way that only added to his charisma. He looked even more tired than before, even more desolate, and all the more alluring for it. Already back then, she'd enjoyed trying to penetrate his mystery. He used to make her throb, and that was still true now, after barely a few seconds. Something about him drew her in, reassured her. He gave her life. She was alive. Alive and jerked off balance by his presence. She felt happy, even though she shouldn't. Maddie. He came back. Maddie, that name which only belonged to him, to them. No, nobody else had ever uttered it. Her eyes filled with tears at the very sound of his earnest voice. They sized one another up like opponents, each transfixed by the other's presence. He felt a stab of panic. It was too good to be true. His hands rose, closing in impossibly slowly on, her, on the face he dreamt of day and night. She stared at his fingers as they inched towards her, forcing herself not to hasten the moment of contact she dreamt about for so many years, that she'd missed ever since the last time he had touched her, that she'd, finally, he reached over, discovering the new grain of skin that had never left him. She trembled. His hand was cold, strong, tender. Her eyes flicked shut with ecstasy. You're real. She surrendered her cheek to the outstretched palm. She felt the caress of his fingers as they brushed away the tear that was rolling down it. He was real. His touch was real. Far too real. She inhaled deeply, breathing in his scent, then pulled away as she opened her eyes once more. He cocked his head, surprised. Then he smiled in that mocking way she so loved back then. She returned it shyly. Instantly, she regretted it, hit by the memory of their first meeting. She'd cast him the same smile when their eyes had locked for the first time, when she was already in love with him. I have to get back, Joshua. My daughter will be getting worried. Her soft, husky voice hadn't changed, the most beautiful harmony he'd ever heard. He smiled at her one more time. She smiled back. Then she turned away and headed for the stairwell, forcing herself not to stagger. She felt drunk, drunk with questions, with consternation, with guilt, Terror, regrets, he was drunk with happiness. Thank you so much, Gia. That was fantastic. Join us in giving her a virtual hand of, uh, of applause. Gia is also a member of our French Reading Club and she represented our department and the university. So thank you very much, Gia. The interpretation can go back on. So, and uh, je vais maintenant changer au français. Donc, euh, de nouveau, so, vous avez des... Once again, we have the globe on your screens, and I wanted to thank both Agnès, Martin, Martin Lugan, and Lilia. And I know that it's already uh, two o'clock, and I have lots of questions, but I would like to give the opportunity to the audience who has come to listen to you and to see you so they can ask you questions, and I will keep my questions for later if we do have the time. But we have around 30 minutes for questions. So you can ask... You can ask your questions in English, in French, or on the chat, but it is important to select the language in which you want to listen to the questions or the answers. So Agnes and myself will stay on the French channel. If you understand both English and French, you can stay on the original flow, uh, the original channel. And if you wish to listen to everything in English, please select the English mm -hmm. channel. And you may ask questions now if you wish to do so. So please do not hesitate to ask for the floor. I do not see the hands. If someone has uh, lifted their hand at the visa, yes, please go ahead and then, and then Orshi. 
Um, I hope you don't mind if I go uh, back to your first novels or the first one followed by, I think, the third, the, the ones about the cafe. Um, I would like to, uh, to pick up a quotation uh, from uh, the, the sequel to uh, the Happy People uh, Read and Drink Coffee, which it was the book, Don't Worry, Life is Easy. And here, the, at the beginning of the novel, uh, the protagonist uh, comments on uh, or says what she wanted her uh, literary cafe to be like. And she says that she wanted to be a warm, welcoming place for everybody, independently of what kind of literature they, uh, uh, her customers might like. And um, so there is here um, a, a reference, a very direct reference to the themes of our conference, because it allows, it it's, uh, um, refers to reading as enjoyment, as pleasure, and also that uh, it didn't matter, she says, whether uh, her customers want a literary prize winner or a best-selling popular novel. What counted was that her, her customers read without feeling they were being judged because of their choices. And so reading has always been a pleasure to me, she says, and I wanted people to come to my book cafe to feel that, to explore, and for those who were the most reluctant to at least try it. Try it. And it didn't matter whether they liked detective novels, general literature, modern romances, poetry, books on, for young adults, biography, bestsellers, and books for the most esoteric of readers. So she is actually stocking this large variety of genres. Now, um, I would like to ask um, to ask you whether you share um, Diane's um, preferences or ideas, and whether where you would place uh, your own work um, in this dichotomy of literary prize-winning novels or best-selling popular novels. And also, I'd like to ask you whether the title of your first novel, um, it, it should actually be read uh, not so much as happy people read and drink coffee, but uh, as rather people who read and drink coffee are happy. Alors, okay, it's my turn then. Well, yes, I I completely share Diane's opinion and what she says about about what she wants for happy people to read and drink coffee, her literary coffee, anyone can be welcome, um, no matter what their choices are. And I, in the deepest sense, in my, I, I think that it doesn't matter. What's important is for people to read. And, and there is really something that I can't stand, which is the opposition of literature genres um, against each other. If you read uh, popular novels, which for someone is a, a swear word, um, popular, then you cannot read what would be called uh, more demanding literature. And I'm actually doing air quotes, as you can see. And so to me, you can go from you can go from one style or from one segment, one literature segment to another, with no difficulty whatsoever. And and what I I think is that my novels are popular novels, and and I say it, and I am sure of it, and it it causes no problem for me. And why is that? Well, because I am lucky, and I have the honor. The fact that many of my readers tell me that thanks to my novels, they have started liking reading or they have, they have recovered their relationship with reading. So for me as an author, there is nothing, nothing better than hearing that. There's no better compliment. 
and maybe reading my popular novels, then maybe those same readers are going to choose at a, a certain point other sort of literature that is more demanding or a bit more chic. I don't know what they could call it. But in any case, we can read everything because to me, literature, uh, all I mean, every literature has its own requirements, we could say. So I wouldn't know how to do something else. I wouldn't be able to, to write uh, detective novels. I could not do it. But maybe a detective novels writer could not do what I do. And I don't understand to be polite. I don't understand this opposition between literary genres. The priority for me is that people go to book to bookshops. Do not be afraid of books. You have to want to just take the books in your hand, to turn them around, to try and look at what it is that they're seeing in them, to 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 be attracted by them. So I have my children, and my my older child loves uh, novels. And the younger one loves uh, comic books and manga. Obviously, I would rather they both read novels. I'm not going to say. Uh, the opposite. But in the end, it's actually not important. What's important is for them to read. It's a different genre. It's a different literary genre. So they, I, ad, I admire um, comic book writers and manga book writers because I could not do that. So what's basic here, I know that in France, many children read uh, comic books and manga, but one day maybe that will lead them towards novels and that does, and they will not forget about manga mangas and comic book comic books and i think that that is the wealth that we need to develop and that's what we need to to encourage so especially with people who are afraid of books thank you thank you so much thank you so much adaljisa and yes it was my um, i'm sorry it was my, my my it was my fault i couldn't see everyone but now now i see everyone i'm in the gallery mode so i can see all the hands and i think that uh, orshi had actually raised her hand uh, who comes from romania so orshi please go ahead yes i uh, thank you for being here it was really really interesting uh, sorry i'm talking in english but i don't speak french and um yeah i was <laughs> I was very fascinated by uh, all the things you have said because it is so interesting to have such a, an intense insight into the working process of an artist, the working process of an author. I think we should do this more often than then people would really go to bookshops. <laughs> so uh, I found it, it really, really interesting, all the things you have said. And what I would like to ask you, because you were talking about how you identify with your characters or how it actually, f you feel them in your body um, when you write from their perspective. And um, if you could talk or, or how, I think it was the best idea. So the, the most uh, touching idea for me that you give so much autonomy to your characters that they can decide what they do. And they are like living people like, um, people with full, full agency for you. And uh, I think that is a really beautiful idea. And what I would like to ask you is uh, how, how it is actually for you. So is it like an experience of ecstasy in sense of stepping out of yourself? Or does it give you like different perspectives? Or um, does it give you like the chances you have uh, talked about the, the, the novel with the hotel that it gives you like an escape from the problems and uh, yeah, how it is. If you can um, dwell even more on that, please. Oui, alors vrai okay, que, uh, yes, it's, it's absolutely true that the relationship that I have with my characters is, I mean, I actually have the feeling that with each novel, I, 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 I leave a process of uh, um, split personality because they have their own um, their own personality and when I say that I can talk to them I actually it's in my head I'm not speaking out loud not yet but but yes it's it's really that feeling of, of hearing their voices of hearing their answers and and I wonder where they're headed 
And it's actually that with air quotes, it's becoming more serious with time, this this way of, of writing where I, I discover what is happening while I'm writing. So while I'm actually on my keyboard, I, I find out what is going to happen because I actually let them decide. And, and nowadays my creative process unfolds that way. So it's true that for my, my last novel, for The Folly, that was the case. So first of all, I need to have the music, the music that will be with me during the writing of that scene, that scene that I am about to write. And once that I have that music, it's I tell the, the, the character, okay, so what are you telling me today? Where are we? And then there is something that star, starts growling and in the end it comes out. And to be honest, when I tell you that I discover things while I'm writing them, it's because it's true. That's how it how it happens. And for instance, if I I could give you an example for the dacha and for the folly. At the dacha, when I was writing the end of the dacha, I did not know that I was writing the end of the book. I, I was actually writing and then at a certain point I stopped. I read the last sentence I had just wrote and I thought, well, that's it. It's, it's done. And I hadn't anticipated anything. And from that moment onward, I, I, I tried to force myself to continue, but no, I, I couldn't. Because the, the characters had nothing else to say, and they asked me to leave them alone. From that moment, they just wanted to live their own lives in the book, and it's for the readers to imagine the, the continuation. And for, the, the, for uh, the folly, at the end of the folly, when I, when I was ending the, the chapter before the last, I knew that it wasn't the last chapter. I knew that. I knew that I had still something to write, but I didn't know what. So I just let things rest for a couple of days. You know, it, it was in my head. It was working in my head, you know, because I knew that the novel was not done. But at a certain point, I, I, you might think I'm completely crazy, but I felt a sort of calling. I thought I have to go back. And I, and I sat before my, com uh, in front of my computer and I, and I looked for some piano music and clack, the, the, the chapter was there. And I didn't know what I was going to write. I just knew that the novel was about to finish once and for all. And I completely discovered everything live, as they say. It was a live discovery. And that's, that to me was an exercise that was, I mean, it's, it's terrifying at times to to think okay I, I don't have a will it's not me I'm just a media I'm just a channel for the history their story and I think no no I, I ha must have a, some sort of mental problem but then at the same time it's adrenaline and it's it, it's dizziness it's it's completely crazy because I don't know what surprise they're going to be reserving for me and at the same time when finally they speak when finally they tell me things it's it's an amazing feeling it's actually pleasure it's pleasure you know suddenly you finally have a question to um, answer to your question sorry and so in the end this way i have of, of working just letting them have their own their own independence, their own free will. It's like in life. I mean, you don't program what is going to happen in life. Well, with my characters, it's it's a bit with me like that. It happens like that. They don't know what they're going to do the day after tomorrow. And I don't know what they're going to do the day after tomorrow. Thank you very much. I think this is really amazing. All you say is amazing. And I don't think at all that is uh, any kind of uh, mental illness or anything like that. It's just like for me, it's, it, this is a proof of <laughs> uh, great sensitivity. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, as, as you were talking, I uh, remember the thing a Hungarian writer once said that the fact that we can interpret books in very different ways and words have different meaning for each of us is a proof of the exist existence of divine. So I, I think this really feels like a, like a spiritual experience, what you are describing, and it's really cool. So thank you for sharing. Merci à vous. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Orshi. Other questions? Either on the chat or you could raise your hand. 
I would love to ask another question, but I don't want Je to monopolize because I have so much I'd like to ask. Is that all right, Sandra? Yeah, of course. Uh, okay, first of all, Agnes, I have to apologize because I, in my first question, I didn't say how much I enjoyed listening to this conversation because I am really worried about us doing something wrong with the recording and then we have no recording of this session. So thank you very much. It was really, really great. My, my, these questions actually follows on from Orshi because she already <coughs> kind of expressed uh, some of the uh, things that I had in my mind, but uh, in, a, in formulating in a different way. Um, and I'd like to ask you how relevant, obviously, it seems to me that is entirely relevant, your uh, profession as a clinical psychologist um, before uh, you started writing. It's clear that you're, uh, you go deep into the inner selves of your characters and bring out uh, you know, everything that is going through them. And it is, I accept the fact that characters come to the writer, you know, the Pirandellian uh, issue of uh, characters who cannot leave him alone and he must write them even if their lives are drama. Um, and so that is perfectly acceptable. I accept that, it's something that more, lots of writers say. However, um, even if they have a life of their own, the fact that you were a clinical psychologist, does it matter? for the fact that you may, and this depends very much also why, you became a writer after being a clinical psychologist. Do you feel that you have a stronger agency, even though the characters have a life of their own, that you actually somehow, subconsciously or deep down, you steer them in behaviors of thinking, of dealing with the inner drama in a different way that perhaps or more agentic than your real customers, their, your real clients when you were a clinical psychologist. Alors, en fait, je crois surtout que... Uh, well, I really think mainly that... Um, I'm going to, to end with a myth here, but my, uh, my, characters, uh, my characters come from my unconscious, obviously, and every time they are, um, they are providing me with a surprise is actually something that unlocks in my unconscious and it becomes conscious. It comes from unconscious to conscious. And I think that what I have learned with, with these years of writing and with the different uh, characters is that they all make me advance, me, uh, personally, as a woman, they all make me advance and understand things about who I am, about, about my aspirations, my expectations, my own anguish. And as I write, um, through them, I am exploring. I am. I'm, I'm scratching my unconscious, and and depending on their reactions, I will be expressing my unconscious. Actually, it is something that I understood as years went by, and more specifically with my last novel. And then my my job as a psychologist, I I actually only worked with little children, so I never had sessions with adults. But, but what I, I mean, all the knowledge that I acquired during my studies and, and during my professional practice, because I, I still I still trained and I still read um, psych, um, psychoanalysis um, books as well, I am always interested. I'm, I have an in-depth um, interest for everything that is um, psychological mechanisms. I like to understand, I like to analyze, I like to tear things apart and understand those mechanisms. And that's what I do with my characters as well. And, and that is why I am always interested for what happens in their minds, in their heads, in their unconscious. And I want, as we go by, um, I want for their unconscious to become conscious and for them to understand why they're reacting this or that way. And then, I, it's also something that I said, I am not my character psychologist. And why am I not their psychologist? Well, because they come from my head. And, and I have no um, perspective 
So I cannot be their psychologist, but somehow in the way I write and what my uh, characters allow me to say, it's actually self-analysis in a way. So that is the, the, the link between my old profession and, and my current profession. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't just say that I am still a psychologist through my characters, because as I said previously, I'm not their psychologist. It was actually they uh, playing the role of my psychologist because they make me go through different stages and they make me grow through what they go through and the, the, the challenges they have to face. Yes, please go ahead, Marie-Lise. Oh, good morning. I am the, the, the French person, peasant, and I am happy to to be able to talk to you um, live. I have been following with great attention everything that you said, and, and I wanted to react a bit and to comment in a personal way everything that I have been listening to. So first of all, something that has something that has made has actually been good as a french person who has lived uh locked down in france um as you have so during the first lockdown i was completely stopped i i blocked i was blocked and some people said oh it was lovely i could actually do this and that no i didn't absolutely not i needed to to actually absorb what was happening at the time yes yes, yes absolutely and to process everything. So I was incapable of turning that into something else, something creative or useful. No, 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 I couldn't. I couldn't leave it like that. So I was happy to see that I was not the only one. <laughs> yes, you were not the only one. Um, now, with regards to what you said about your relationship with the character and everything that has to do with your, your merging with the character and the therapeutical relationship, which actually was very interesting what you said about all of these things, but I couldn't actually stop me from asking about what has to do, but you also answered um, somehow this question that I wanted to ask about what the characters actually brought about, what they gave you in your uh, personal life and and if we rebound uh, from that idea i would like to ask you what it is that you expect to give to your readers even if it is not something that you think about i don't know i'm asking is there some sort of uh, cathartic dimension for yourself which i believe you've already answered you've already answered that question but what about the readers have you well you said at a certain point that you wanted to get them out of their comfort area uh, out of their comfort zone so that they could be a bit more participative more active is that something that worries you? Is that something that you deliberately uh, want to do? Is it conscious? Or uh, do you have an ideal reader, um, um, something that you have uh, imagined, some, some reader that you have imagined? So what's the role of readers in your creation process? Well, as I said, I, I, when I go to uh, fairs, book fairs or, or bookshops, I do not think about the readers when I write. I do not think of them because I do not want to write what they ask me to write. So I'm not going to say, okay, there is a code that I need to respect in order to re to write a story so that they would like it. No, to me that that is unthinkable because it has to be honest. It has to be mm, honesty above all. And then we say uh, about my room, about my novels that they do good and that they make make people feel well. But that's not my expectation at all when I write. What I do is I tell a story. I tell. And my, my hope with this story is that it will make people think. Just think. So that the people who will discover this story will own this story, read this story. I am not looking to do good with my stories. What, I, what interests me is that once the story is done for readers and that they close the book, I have told um, parts of lives. I have done. I have written a portrait and talking about different phases in life that we might have overcome. So when the reader closes the book, I would like him to say, "If I had been in their shoes, 
Est-ce que je peux What me confronter à ça Comment Could je I face this How can I prepare myself for this um, Does it scare me to think about this And to tell yourself, maybe I wouldn't have reacted um, as the main character has, but now I can understand because I have all these elements. So what interests me is for, uh, for not to judge um, in certain cases when we don't have all the elements. So in the end, that's the only expectation that I have when I write. So my last novel, The Folly, talks about death. C'est pas grave and d'écrire un roman sur la mort. And pas grave de lire it's not serious. I mean, it's not. Um, it's not a problem to write about death or read about death. It simply allows you to think, to ask questions, to 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 get rid of some of the anguish. That's what I did when I wrote it. I actually wrote my anguishes. I I, I put I put words to my anguish, and it was quite freeing. And to me. What's important is to make people think. Sometimes it, sometimes it's it's something that that tickles or even hurts um, having to think, but it makes you advance. It makes you progress, and it's the only thing that I expect. That the only thing that I hope I can, I can cause in my reader's minds. Yes, thank you, thank you so much for your answer. I can tell you that that you actually you succeed, you succeed in that obje objective, and. What I would have liked to add is that I feel that when that when we read your novels, I, we feel less alone. I'm actually linking with the lockdown um, experience. We read something that is familiar to us. It resonates somehow. And it's in that sense that it, it does you good. I mean, it's just belonging, belonging to, to the human race. And you feel less alone in situations that you have chosen because they have something that uh, makes them iconic, for instance. And whether we have gone through them or not, we obviously can recognize ourselves in those situations, in those characters, and we can actually project ourselves into those situations and we feel less alone with these problems, these existential problems. And and as someone was saying previously, I think it was Orsi who said it, um, she talked about our spiritual dimension. I think that there is something that has to do with, with uh, this um, initiating journey, we could say. That's something that you begin with your, with your readers. Thank you, Marily, Agnès. I am aware of the fact that uh, time is running, but if we have a last short question, because uh, Matilde could stay with us for a few minutes still. So if you have any other questions that you would like to ask before we finish this session, or since we're talking about uh, characters, yes, Adelisa, please go ahead. Um, Sandra, I want to. I don't want to take over the last bit, though. Is there anybody else who wants to ask anything? Moi, j'en ai plein. Hein, mais... <laughs> Moi, j'en ai encore. Des... I have loads. I have loads of questions. I have uh, lots of pages of questions. But I wanted to ask a, a question about the characters, if I could. This is a personal question. Are there some uh, main characters or some other uh, secondary characters that you would like to keep on writing about uh, or that you would like to write a story about? I have some characters that I would like to revisit, yes. I would like to get uh, their news. No, there is no there is no second part foreseen for any of my novels. I did it once, it's true, with the Happy People and uh, Life's Easy, but I knew that when I finished writing Happy People that I was not done with Diane and Diane was not was not done with me and she still had some ways to go. So that was something that had been foreseen from the beginning. And then there are no second uh, parts uh, foreseen, but we never know what could happen uh, but we must il faut, il que ça ait du sens. I mean Je it would have to make sense I go back to that notion of making sense so uh, Je vais pas juste faire une I'm not just going to do a follow-up just because where nothing would happen and it would be the second part that everyone is expecting. I know that in France, for instance, I'm finishing a, um, a, a book signing um, 
a book In signing Netflix. and people are asking me for a second part uh, for the Dutch app but it's there is no going to there is not going to be a second part if it doesn't make sense Hermine or another uh, character Basili Samuel uh, Charlie uh, would have to knock on my door quite uh, quite strongly so that they have to they have to tell me that there is something that they need to understand something that they have to go through because I could write the second part of the Dutch I will do it in 30 pages and everyone will say uh, is she laughing at us I mean that's not possible that cannot be so so there I, I just cannot say never you cannot say never but but it really really has to make sense something needs to happen in that in that second part I need to be shaken I need to be shaken by what my characters are going to go through and they have to really be moved so that we can spend some time together again thank you so much so uh, waiting for the next novel whether it is a second part or not we thank you from the bottom of our hearts I don't know if you have a short question Adelgisa maybe one last short question uh, thank you very much yes I do have one um, at the end of your the English translation of uh, happy people read and drink coffee you thank your publisher for having gone off the beaten track and respecting my journey and my freedom what did you mean by that and uh, what did you mean especially by going off the beaten track what was the track was there expect were there expectations that you would follow a certain track and how did you veer off them of it alors c'est parce qu'en fait uh... well, it's actually because the uh, Michel Lafon, the publishing house, was the first publishing house in France that has published a self-published um, novel from a complete stranger, and it was me. So I'm the first one in France who published her own book, who was then published by a big publishing house. And and, and taking that same book again, so my book uh, lived two months on Amazon, and and then and they took it out so that they could they could publish it in bookshops a few months later and it's the first time that it ever happened in france and they they were audacious enough to do it they were courageous enough to do it because they did believe deeply believed in that the, the that the book could have a life in the in bookshops and it's actually that that's exactly exactly what i meant when i thanked them because they got out of the traditional path in in french publishing houses but i'm talking to you about 10 years ago things have evolved now so but that's actually what i meant when i thanked them Thank you so much. Thank and I you. think that this takes us to the end because we are really in the thanking part of things. And since we were talking about Michel Lafon, I want to thank Honorine for uh, her help, her support, and all the materials that she has sent our way. And thank you for having put us in touch so that we could have this afternoon together. Thank you so much, Honorine. And I hope that we will be able to continue this collaboration with other in other cases. And I wanted to thank Gia and Nadia for their reading in English and for their participation in everything that we ever offer them. And I also wanted to thank Matilde, whom I'm sure you listening in English because it would not have been possible without her and also wanted to thank Rosie who has sent the translations and as we say in English last but not least we have to thank Agnès Martin Lugan for this amazing afternoon that we spent together and let's hope that in the future we'll be able to see each other and do this face to face with the book signing up signing the book with some coffee a um, glass of wine depending on when no I thank you it has been it has been um, really 
amazing and being able to do this after two years I could have continued having an, a, a, a very active exchange with all of you I hope we can have other times for us to do this I would like to really thank the two readers in English it was really moving for me to hear my text in, the, in another language just after I read it this uh, sort of simultaneous reading in two languages was really moving so I really want to thank them thank you you all for the organization. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you so much for having orchestrated this whole thing. Thank you, because it was a really pleasurable moment we spent together. Thank you so much. And now I think that everyone needs to rest, especially Matilde. But uh, for the rest of us, we will uh, connect again at a, a quarter past three for the last session today. So we'll see you very soon. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.